Jordan Abel is a NISCA writer from British Columbia. Currently, he is pursuing a PhD at Simon Fraser University, where his research concentrates on the intersection between digital humanities and indigenous literary studies. Abel's creative work has recently been anthologized in Best Canadian Poetry from Tightrope. The Land We Are, Artists and Writers Unsettled the Politics of Reconciliation from Arbiter Ring, and The New Concrete, Visual Poetry in the 21st Century from Hayward. Abel is the author of Injun, Uninhabited, and The Place of Scraps, winner of the Dorothy Livesay Poetry Prize and finalist for the Gerald Lampert Memorial Award. I was introduced to Jordan Abel in An Ethics of Generosity last quarter. He is an indigenous author who fruitfully experiments in the medium that has been classified as erasure poetry, plunder verse, and the mining of a text. Abel's techniques are inherently tied to the physicality of the space his poems occupy. The thesis is not solely vested in the words on the page, but somewhere specifically in the between. The Place of Scraps is a book that exists waist deep in dialogue with ethnographer Marius Barbeau's seminal work, Totem Poles. Each passage carves away bit by bit at the complex relation between white colonialist, colonialist ethnographers and the indigenous populations of North America, oftentimes leaving the latticework of absence between words in the process, an absence that portrays one of the many consequences of white colonialist expansion. Even when an effort was made by colonizers to reverse the damage already done to First Nations cultures and heritage, the end result was a curatory process that left nothing but scraps. Reading Abel's work leaves us, the audience, with a sense of Democlean gravity. A voice wrested from oppressive narratives hangs breathlessly in the air, at times turning corners of thought with a rushing whisper that stands up off the page like snakeskin, at times clustering in dense, crowded visual expressions, and always with a raw anatomy that stands starkly against its own source text. There is a thematic stretch here, but bear with me. If most poetic work is a UFO sighting, an otherworlded blinking light soaring through the empty sky over Nevada, then I invite you all to think of Jordan Abel's work as a UFO crash, and Abel is elbow deep in autopsies and grainy footage, examining the rubble, what caused the craft to fail, the impact on the local wildlife, weighing organs, and learning. Now may I present Jordan Abel. Hey. Thank you. That was such a lovely introduction. <laughs> I don't think my writing has ever been compared to a UFO crash before, but I think, I, I think I'm going to use that from now on. It's the only way I'm going to talk about my own writing. <laughs> uh, hey, everyone. Thanks, uh, thanks for being here. Uh, my name's Jordan. Uh, I'm a NISCA writer. Uh, I'm from Vancouver, uh, but not the Vancouver that's south of here. I'm from the Vancouver that's north of here, kind of. <laughs> um, so when I was thinking about what I was going to talk to you about today, uh, I kind of I, I went between a number of different topics. Uh, and the thing, that I, the thing that I landed on that I really wanted to do uh, was to talk to you about uh, this uh, undercurrent of poetry uh, that a couple, of, a couple of people have a, different, a few different names for it, but the one that uh, comes to mind um, or that comes to the, that's come to the forefront in the recent months is uh, conscientious conceptualism. Uh, so I'm going to talk about that, and I'm going to talk about uh, maybe where my work fits fits into that undercurrent of of uh, contemporary poetry, and then I'm also going to uh, perform some of my poetry for you as well, uh, which is the thing that I'm actually really the most excited about doing. Uh, so, yeah, that that's the way this is going to go, and then I guess. Uh, there will be time for questions at the end. Uh, so if you think of any questions, uh, I'd be, I, I really would be more than happy to engage with any and or all of them. <laughs> um, OK. So, uh, so I guess for those of you, so I guess there's clearly some of you who are familiar with my writing. Uh, but for those of you who uh, who maybe haven't haven't read any of my work, 
Uh, I would say that um, I often describe my writing uh, as writing that uses the tools and methodologies of conceptual poetry to engage with indigenous issues and to critique settler writing. Uh, so I think this is maybe a really clumsy way to describe what it is that I do. Uh, but I, I, and I often feel that it would be much easier to call myself a conceptual writer, uh, except that uh, that label doesn't quite fit for me. And in fact, I think there's probably really good cause uh, for me to distance myself from the label of conceptual poetry. Um, I think, especially in the wake of uh, Kenneth Goldsmith's piece, uh, The Body of Michael Brown, that he performed at the Interrupt Three conference, where he appropriated black suffering and reinscribed white power over racial bo racialized bodies, especially in the wake of Vanessa Place's Gone with the Wind project, uh, that uncritically replicated a racist text in a gesture that has since been called literary blackface. And uh, I think these are just two examples that were enough for critics everywhere uh, to take uh, another look at how problematic conceptual writing <laughs> has been or can be. Um, yeah. And I think you know these were also two examples that were enough for uh, Ken Chen uh, to suggest that conceptual poetry as a brand is perhaps dead. Uh, and while I hesitate to 100% uh, agree with Chen, I don't really disagree with him either. Uh, perhaps the time for unethical, uncritical poetry is over. Uh, or at least, you know, I, I do hope it's over. I mean, to me, the, the public reaction to both Goldsmith and Place uh, it indicates that we're all tired of irresponsible, problematic, unaccountable arts and artists. Uh, so my, my question is, is what, comes, what comes next? Uh, what happens uh, to all the artists and writers who are using conceptualism ethically? And is their conceptualism dead too? Uh, or is that a different kind of conceptualism, a different kind of art? Uh, one that falls out of the boundaries of the kind of conceptualism that Goldsmith and Place have been relentlessly marketing to us for years. Uh, so I think this is, this is kind of my starting place uh, to talk about uh, conscientious conceptualism. Um, I, so this isn't my favorite label, uh, uh, but it is uh, perhaps a label that encapsulates other terms and other kinds of ethical conceptualisms, uh, plural. And here I should say that uh, one of the problems uh, with naming or labeling, as uh, poet and scholar Stephen Collis suggests, is that each name comes with the baggage of marketability. Uh, Collis would prefer not to name uh, and to resist capitalism's co-opting of naming and labeling. Uh, but, but even Collis kind of agrees that uh, with naming also comes a certain kind of visibility. And I think the thing that I want to make visible today is something that maybe we can talk about as uh, conscientious conceptualism, or maybe talk about whatever that is under the banner of a different name. But that's the thing I really am hoping to zero in on. Uh, so, uh, so, Another starting place, this, this talk is full of starting places. I'm constantly starting over and over again. <laughs> uh, but for Poetry Month in Canada, there's a blog, or it's, it's like a literary arts and culture online magazine, I guess, 
uh, it's called The Puritan. And this poet slash scholar, Andy Verboom, um, curated uh, a series of blog posts on conscientious conceptualism. Um, and uh, in Verboom's opening discussion of what conscientious conceptualism is, uh, he ends up starting with a question that I think is, is actually uh, fu fundamental. Uh, so he asks, if there is a precedence for and a community of what can be called conscientious conceptualism. Um, and I, I do think this is actually a pretty honest question and one that actually I think maybe even has a really easy answer. I don't know a single artist or writer who self-describes themselves as a conscientious conceptualist. <laughs> Not one. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that being said, I, I think uh, that what Verboom is looking for in this question uh, is not something so attached to that label necessarily, but uh, he's instead, I think, interested in thinking about um, how artists uh, that may or may not identify as conceptualists um, but who use uh, the tools of conceptualism in their arts, how they ethically navigate those spaces. Um, and in, in, his, uh, in his call for submissions, uh, he, he kind of writes this uh, thing that he uh, specifically says is not a manifesto for conscientious conceptualism but it also kind of is <laughs> a little bit. And I think, I, think it's worth looking at, I think it's worth looking at a few of those points and talking about them and, and what's, uh, what they may or may not mean and maybe how I, as an artist, do or do not disagree with the contours of, uh, of that uh, mini manifesto. Um, so, I'm going to go through these five points, these uh, five manifesto items, uh, but I think, I, I, but I, I would suggest that these are not necessarily parameters for what conscientious conceptualism is, um, and nor are they rules exactly, but they are an attempt to, to define an undercurrent. Um, and they're an attempt to define uh, an undercurrent that seems to uh, resist singularity and definition. So uh, you, you don't have to you don't have to read all of this. Uh, but the, the the main uh, the main thing uh, that I got out of this is that conscientious conceptualism puts ethics before aesthetics, uh, which. Uh, I, I don't know, I guess that makes sense to me. Uh, we, we can talk about all of these later too. Um, the, I mean, I, I, guess, I guess he's really saying uh, ethics is a priority <laughs> in, this, in this form of art. So this, this, this is the quickest manifesto item. Um, the, the next one, conscientious conceptualism is ethical tactical rather than political strategical, because strategical isn't a word. Uh, <laughs> I, I, okay, so I guess strategical isn't a word. Uh, I'll, I'll give him that. I, 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 don't know, I don't know about this one. Uh, <laughs> I would say that, I mean, the best art that I can think of that falls into this category <laughs> is actually both ethically aware and politically aware simultaneously. Um, whether or not either of those categories requires tactics or strategies, I, I'm not sure. I'm not, sh I'm not, sh I'm not sure if, it, if, 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 they, if they require that exactly. Um, they definitely both require purpose and care. Uh, and 
I, I, I guess uh, I guess my question is, does purpose and care overlap with tactics and strategy? I don't know. We we, we can talk about this. Uh, so the, his his next his next manifesto item uh, is that conscientious conceptualism. Uh, acknowledges that most conceptual poetry written by straight or white straight cis male poets is presumed to self-position as blithely apolitical, while most conceptual poetry written by, in quotes, other poets is assumed to have a reparative political agenda, meaning that the contours of ethics are largely forgotten. Yeah. I don't know about this one either. <laughs> uh, so I, I specifically, I don't know if conscientious conceptualism or artists and works that fall, maybe fall under this categorization have to acknowledge any other writing as being apolitical in order to exist. Uh, and I think that it seems to be this kind of, kind of what he's saying. Um, is that uh, there's, there, there is a, a re relationship there that necessitates uh, a certain kind of like white apolitical writing. Uh, and I, I think, um, and, I, and I think it may be true uh, that there is a contingent of white, straight, cis, male, conceptual poets uh, who write work that can be called apolitical. Um, but I really, like when I think about that kind of work, I don't think that work is necessary for the conscientious, for conscientious conceptualism to exist. Or I, I, I don't think it's, it's a requirement, exactly. I mean, I think, you know, when I, when I wrote, you know, when I write my own writing that critiques uh, the representations of indigenous peoples in, uh, let's say, the Western genre, uh, I, I don't require um, Kenneth Goldsmith in order to be able to do that. Uh, and... Yeah, and, and so, I mean, maybe that, that's where I get hung up on this particular manifesto item. Um, but that, that being said, though, um, maybe, uh, maybe my work isn't visible um, until, uh, in, in, until the kind of uh, public collapse of, of people like Goldsmith or, you know, I, I do think there there is definitely um, there, there there's definitely an issue uh, with levels of visibility here. Okay. So conscientious conceptualism is anti-archival uh, and anti-museum because ethical, slash, ethical archival slash museum access is that, which, uh, is that which objects to the codes of conduct required for and by preservation. Um, as you might suspect, conscientious conceptualism is not properly curatorial because cur curation is some pretty high-end, small badge strategical stuff. Okay, <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't really know about this one either. Uh, <laughs> I think, you know, for, for my purposes, I do think the archive is necessary. Uh, I think, I, I, to that being said, I do think the archive is problematic, and the archive is problematic because of the gaps in the archive. But I think those gaps can be addressed, and I and people are working on those gaps uh, and filling them right now. In my other life as a PhD student, uh, I'm I'm working on an archive of indigenous poetry, and that and working on that archive is attempting 
to, to fill a gap uh, or to, uh, to reposition in, like, indigenous writing within an archive that doesn't currently have any indigenous poetry in it. Uh, so, you know, I think, I, I think anti-archive is a bit strong for me, but I do think it is worth recognizing the problems in, in, in archiving uh, and in the archive. Um, likewise, uh, I think, you know, anti-museum is, is interesting to me. As, uh, as an indigenous person, uh, it's, it is actually really kind of uh, genuinely troubling uh, to walk into a museum and see an indigenous people's exhibit right next to uh, an ancient Egypt exhibit. Um, and to have to address that myth of the disappearing and or disappeared Indian all over again. You know, because I, I mean, indigenous peoples have been struggling against that, uh, I, I guess, uh, colonial pressure <laughs> uh, for years. And clearly, we haven't disappeared. We're still here. Uh, you know, I think, um, that that colonial genocide ultimately failed. Uh, so, you know, I, 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 but the way museums seem to buy in, or way, the way a lot of museums seem to buy into that logic, I think is genuinely troubling. Uh, but that being said, I do think there are a number of museums that uh, Work, work past that kind of colonial discourse. Uh, there's, there's a museum in Vancouver um, called the Museum of Anthropology. It's, in, it's on the University of British Columbia grounds. And that museum, if you ever get a chance to go, is really amazing and special because it's, instead of positioning indigenous peoples in this, uh, in this sense of past history, they really kind of uh, embrace contemporary indigenous presence and uh, and also traditional knowledges, you know. But but I think you know in a way that um, affirms in, in indigenous uh, life, you know, in a way that other other museums uh, don't necessarily. So again, I I, I think. Anti-archive slash anti-museum, I don't think is necessary exactly, uh, but but uh, to instead, I think um, think about how those thing, how those, uh, I guess, ideas can be mobilized uh, to include uh, indigenous presences. All right, so this is the last, uh, this is the last manifesto point for Verboom. Uh, conscientious conceptualism is more pleasurably experienced as negative utopianism uh, describing what good futures don't resemble to us than as positive dystopianism describing what bad futures do to us. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I don't know about this one either. <laughs> Is the work of conscientious conceptualism meant to be pleasurable? That's a que that's a question that I'm leaving open. And what does that mean? Uh, I'm I'm honestly not really sure how much utopian slash dystopian dynamics really matters in this context. Uh, and and I, I say that because most of the work that I've read that maybe falls under the category of conscientious conceptualism um, is addressed to the present moment. And I think that's not to say that it's not worth thinking about um, indigenous futurity, for example, but you know, I think I, I'm, I'm unsure what to do with Verboom's uh, ideas of utopianism slash dystopianism in this particular context. Okay, <laughs> so do, do you guys all know what conscientious conceptualism is yet? 
That's an open question. <laughs> uh, okay, so another, th another uh, I guess, label that potentially falls under conscientious conceptualism uh, is lyric conceptualism. And I think, uh, and, and there, there, uh, there are, I guess, well, I, actually there's one critic in particular who has been talking about lyric conceptualism, uh, a poet slash scholar, Sina Kiris, out of Montreal. Um, and I think, I, I don't know how she would feel exactly about, uh, about lyric conceptualism being included under the banner of conscientious conceptualism. Uh, but the, the way I've been thinking about this is that these are all labels that are attempting to describe this thing that is very difficult to describe. Um, so I think, you know, potentially there, there, potentially there is overlap or there are overlaps, uh, but potentially there aren't any overlaps either. Um, so I think uh, my, my, my thinking so far is that whatever this thing that, we're, that I'm attempting to describe actually is, has multiple pathways through it. Uh, so, lyric conceptualism. Uh, Kiris has talked about this quite a bit, but she wrote also a very useful manifesto that's basically uh, a poem um, that, this, uh, this is an excerpt of a middle section of it, uh, but I'll read you a few, a few other excerpts, and so we can reconvene and figure out what this thing actually is. Um, so, the lyric conceptualist has moved beyond the indigestible and the unreadable. In fact, beyond all gestures that have made pleasure the enemy of reading. Still, the lyric conceptualist remains true to her politics of inclusion, appreciating the thinker thinkership of conceptual poetry, the revelations in mass assemblages that uh, concretize the ephemeral textuality of daily life. Yet she stubbornly continues to bask in the reverie of solitude. Lyric conceptualism indulges in the excess of language while appreciating the clean lines of the minimal. Lyric conceptualism does not confuse clarity with simplicity. Lyric conceptualism rejects naive notions of truth and beauty. Lyric conceptualism is not simply expressionism. Lyric conceptualism does not accept that content does not matter and still appreciates the way that content does not always matter. If the lyric conceptualist lives in a forest, it may be a concrete one or a forest planted and quaffed by humans as much as animals, though she is not ready for the merely virtual or textual. The lyric conceptualist likely has one foot in the gallery and one foot on the earth. She can make the distinction between floor and ground. She knows a book and how to read one in myriad forms. Lyric conceptualism is unable to turn away from the problems of the earth and yet committed to thinking through the way we think about the problems of the earth. Yes, Lyric conceptualism still believes in world. To that end, lyric conceptualism doesn't shy away from being used as a protest tool and is not adverse to being occupied or called into action. The lyric conceptualist is a trough that catches the excess, the offcuts, the remnants, the awful language. Lyric conceptualism is interested in fun, but not wedded only to the ironic, the distant and mocking. Lyric conceptualism's goal is to create openings rather than closures. It offers itself as a courtyard, stadium, meadow, and variously a reclaimed parking lot, a battlefield made food scoop, a factory turned performance space, a transitional space, reclaimed land, an idea with no end. 
So, I'll, 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 let, I'll let that uh, sink in for a second, and we can, we can return to lyric conceptualism uh, in a moment, and I'll, I'll, I'll just move on to this, to, to this other undercurrent, uh, poetic terrorism. <laughs> Uh, so this one, oh, well, you you, you all saw it. Poetic terrorism. <laughs> uh, so poetic terrorism uh, is a term that Kate Siklosi has been talking about recently, uh, and she borrows the term from Hakim Bey, who uses it in a book called T A Z the temporary autonomous zone to describe fleeting liberation from status codes of logic, propriety, and ownership by means of a poetic game that attempts to bridge the gap between material and imagined realities. Uh, so for Siklosi, um, acts of poetic terrorism are meant to shock people out of their day-to-day -day lives by extracting different possibilities from aesthetic experiences outside the sanctions of law and state. So to describe the work of, uh, of writers who poetically terrorize, to describe the work of these writers uh, who poetically terrorize historical and present discourse by unsettling the language and logic of the state, of the law, of the nation, and of codified language itself. And uh, so closely actually also essentially includes a, a reading list of her favorite poetic terrorists uh, who include Harriet Mullen, Benu Kapil, uh, Shane Rhodes, Rachel Zolf, Mark Novak, uh, M. Norbisse Philip, uh, and, and my, my work as well. Um, and what's, what's clear to me um, about these labels and about talking about uh, the intersections between conscientious conceptualism, lyric conceptualism, and poetic terrorism is that, uh, me, the, is that those, three, those three banners pretty much all include the same group of writers. Uh, so there's, there's, a, there's a coterie there that that's, uh, these scholars are attempting to zero in on. Um, and, I, and I think, and, and Lisa Robertson uh, comes up specifically in Sinakiris' writing. I would also suggest that the writing of Moez Sirani, uh, specifically his latest book, Operations, also falls, falls under this, this, these plural banners in some way or another. Um, yeah. So, I think... One of the main issues for me is that uh, I never set out as an artist to be a conscientious conceptualist or a lyric conceptualist or a poetic terrorist. Uh, I never even really set out to be a conceptualist. Um, so I think the, this discussion uh, is, uh, the discussion about naming and labeling I think can be productive, um, but I think it can also only take us so far. Uh, and for me, writing doesn't really happen, writing and creativity doesn't really happen under a banner or under a label. Um, writing, I think, really only happens when you have something to say or you have something to comment on. Uh, so that leads me um, to the point where I'm going to share some of my own writing with you. And the, the book that I'm going to share with you, or the, uh, I guess I'll share a couple pieces depending on whether or not I run out of time here. Um, but the, the, fir the first one I'm going to share with you uh, comes from my, my latest book slash project, uh, which is called Engine. Um, and this, this book was built out of 91 public domain Western novels. Uh, and it's, at, so I'll, I'll describe the process. Uh, 
I went to Project Gutenberg, I copied and pasted 91 Western novels uh, that are in the public domain. I copied and pasted them into a single Word document so that I could search all of the novels simultaneously. Uh, that document ended up being 10,000 pages long uh, and crashes my computer basically every time I try and open it. Uh, <laughs> Microsoft Word was not meant to handle that volume of text, I don't think. <laughs> uh, so, I, so in that 10,000 page source text, I searched for the word engine, and I was really kind of, uh, I was curious about how that word fit into the Western genre, and I was very curious specifically to look at individual contexts. And I found uh, over 500 sentences that contained the word engine. Um, and I read all 500 of those sentences and I copied and pasted them into their own Word documents. That document ended up being a much more reasonable 26 pages. Uh, so I printed those pages out and I got a pair of scissors and I cut up each page into an individual section of a long poem. Uh, so that's how that, uh, pro that, that's basically what that project is. Um, and whether, whether or not it fits under the banner of conscientious conceptualism or lyric conceptualism or poetic terrorism, I, 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 don't, I don't know exactly. You know, I mean, I think, uh, I'd, be, I'd be curious to hear what you guys think about that. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll let you decide for yourselves. Uh, so if you guys can turn off the, the lights, we can get this thing started. The boys group themselves clean down these. Cut fire of the whitest sand. He played English across the trail where girls turned plum, wild garlic, and strange words through the window of night. He spoke through numb lips and breathed frontier. He heard snatches of comments going up from the riverbank. All them engines is people first. And besides for this fuck skin, why we even he shoot them? Engine and seems God like a sign of dream. Dead as a horse ranch just prove themselves. Had time to pedal their eyes, done to lean out and say the truth. Fire out of the whitest. All your engines is just white keys. He played the English across the trail. Summer girls was turned plumb, bent towards him and guarded to pair of strange words through the window of night. A bull winder of dirty tenderness that stiffened each other little breath and breathed frontier. That dead ancient game. He heard snatches of comment and fetched over up a pitch from fire. the riverbank. <coughs> Two yards of bright luck packed through a mangy boy. All the engines is it's been people be a peaceable hills going and the side of the engine down from the storm. Nay, 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 why would the buck to go to the water? Again? And spraying just like a spion of warm, a reserve of gas for the dead. Or dusted straight into a big hill, and time to pedal no their eyes and then lean out only concerned me the fire. All your smoke chances is a giant knife drop on keys that some might consider some fierce part of heaps, some crooked swell pretenders. Bent towards him and produced a pair of nickel plated pullers, a stained bull winder of dirty straight walking in the midst of the stiff faces that alone get round ice, that trigger finger in the ship on game. One straight in trust over a broken just fire gold, and two yards of bright luck packed. They dreamed nights we boiled. They had eyes of the anticipate of peasy syllable. No free not a going on a crazy over the engines or crept up engines in the ground of whiskey from the storm and the bucked gold and water right in engines in the heat of domestics. 
spray with the soap of gas fed their candles and buried straight into the like they kill against day. No talk of rain or night, 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 night only the concern the doubt or smoke or fire very found just home dying from a night ground straw to silence. That someone might be considered just part of slanted their memories in the back. Driven through ten flat breathed their red instinct. His eyes squared their minds and altered up to ease straight walk off in the typical country. Faces in their blood, their dreams, kids, and the trigger fingers are in their pockets. Pockets, one straight trail of gun, this is trigger camp goals, bad as a trace. They had dreamed of a nightmare, and they had eyes over a fist, a licked glass, no jelly, nodded in the water, and the pockets of soldiers were rubbed up in the gleaming of discovery. Engines in a heap. If crayons boil over the lanterns, buried light it again. Day trouble now. Rightful old trip. The doubt outlasted. Just cattle. After all, fellow, don't shoot. A promise of an appetite of one man as a man can be anybody's death. The memories on the back. Even snakes are made to breathe on granite. Even bandages washed away. Who squared their minds, staring the way down on grubs' stake? Just pop the signs to call all the country. Who kept their dreams in the sun to Great towns, pockets is filled with knives to get camp. All he looks by the same trash. A two year old one on the night closes and then the side bed bedways glancing a licked glass of jelly bordering a day for territory a partial engine tongues. Daddy, you see, you're a little bit of 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 a Changed him because of some man who brought their peaceful skin and I think he's a little as the heart of the morning dragged him more by that little even than that man in the squad away from the war path has just as us to all the time to discuss screaming as us kept hard sparkling the night void is that hates the troubles of the night the letters of time all women that feeds at the milk house in all the same straight glass by the that is a same age Rush all the grub and somewhere down in the hungry belly of the drunks of silver. All the gold and dog cries are now at the back door. Like a pack of all days for a dollar mixing mineral lands of the real thing you can see for yourself. Let's play engine and cleaning no our cells cells on the slash land that shaking tray. Is it the same walk like gun and a hand? No leveled rifle. And the woods this is this is so long towards the day. Back to the bloody corner. To that mad, pale faced set. Burning good fellows dead. God. Back to the folks I call. Sweet, 
Thanks. Uh, so, questions? <laughs> is, it, is it that time? Should we just do that? <laughs> Yeah, so these, uh, these pieces come from my second book, uh, which is called Uninhabited. Uh, and it comes from a, a section of that book called Cartography. Okay. So, it's, so they're, uh, they're essentially uh, maps with... Well, oh, okay. Uh, well, the, the reason why I include them... Um, well, actually, there's two reasons, and one of them is a really unsatisfying reason. So uh, I'll start with the unsatisfying reason first. Uh, at, at, like, in sometimes at university classrooms, in order to get the audio out of my laptop, I also need to project something. Uh, <laughs> this, this is a really unsatisfying part. So in order for you to hear the thing that I did, you also had to look at this. <laughs> or you had to look at something. And I, and I, I figured it's easier to look at this than to look at my cluttered desktop. Uh, so that's the unsatisfying answer. The more satisfying answer is that um, uninhabited and engine 
both come from the same corpus of source texts. So they're books that are, that like in their entirety are derived from those 91 Western novels. So to me, they're actually just two sides of the same project that were just published separately. Yeah. Um, and my performance, my performance of Injun actually also includes excerpts from Uninhabited as well. So to me, like when I perform them, I'm performing them together. Uh, so I think uh, these uh, these sections from uh, cartography from Uninhabited are in some way tied into these questions. Like they're, they're I mean, that book primarily deals with land and territory uh, and concepts of ownership, and Injun primarily deals with uh, the representations or misrepresentations of indigenous peoples. And I think in both cases. Um, my poetic intervention is to uh, is to dis to disrupt uh, not only like those uh, like damaging images of indigenous peoples, but also to disrupt those damaging co like, concepts of land and ownership. I think, and of of uh, I guess uh, blank kind of terra nullius space. Um, so that, that's a little bit about why, why that's up there. <laughs>
it was because of how problematic that genre is and, and because of uh, how people react to that genre. Um, but I, I know so many people who kind of unapologetically love the Western. And I can't, I can't get behind that because every Western that I've read or I've seen, uh, you know, in, indigenous peoples are so misrepresented and also, you know, usually the enemy somehow, or at least othered. And I, and I think, you know, those, like, there's this incredible kind of, uh, like, both physical and metaphorical violence that happens against indigenous peoples in that genre that, you know, my, uh, my engagement um, with, with, uh, with, with that genre is, is through critique. And I think in going into those texts and pulling them apart and isolating the specific, like isolating the context around like a racist pejorative term, I think is, is not only important, um, I, I, I think, personally, because, you know, it's really, like, once you zero, zero in on those 500 sentences that all contain the word engine, it's really easy to kind of pick apart, you know, how, uh, how racism is constructed. And I think, you know, going through that and, like, dis dismantling uh, those kinds of structures, I think, you know, is, is really, like, extremely cathartic. And, you know, that, like, and you know, and then cutting up those sentences, you know, is for a further catharsis. Um, I think so much so that, like, you know, my I think my whole like like all of my poetics could be somehow described as both critique and catharsis, uh, or critique slash catharsis. Um, but I mean, I guess at the same time, though, uh, you know, I do think there are. I, one of the things that I ask myself um, all the time, uh, or a question that's recurred to me recently, is 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 what is indigenous literature, and is my writing indigenous literature? Uh, and I, you know, they're both at, like kind of rhetorical questions, but I've attempted to answer them as well. And I think. Uh, one of the ways that I've been thinking through that um, is that the, or one of the, the problems that I've encountered in thinking through that is that you know, the, the kind of writing that I do that's based on appropriating uh, you know, um, old, dead, white settler writing, uh, like it, it starts out as being fundamentally non-indigenous. Uh, but by like you know by the time it you know becomes a book or by the time I've written it, it somehow somehow has transformed into indigenous writing. So I think there's like a certain kind of articulation of indigenous presence that happens at some like at some moments throughout that text that I think moves beyond critique and catharsis, and, it, and it's about um, reclaiming indigenous modes of understanding and and parsing the world i don't know if i don't know if that's totally like a satisfying answer <laughs> but I, I but i think you know I, I, yeah I, I think those are the ways i begin maybe to an, to answer your question I, I, I think it's, it's difficult to, to navigate. Um, I mean, for me, I think, I, th I think having some critical framework can be extraordinarily helpful. But I think, I, I think there are overlap, there, there are overlapping modes of critical frameworks and frameworks that come from just different kinds of disciplines that I think you know, might be important to, to, to think about. And, you know, for me, like, some of those frameworks come from indigenous studies, and some come from, you know, uh, I guess, like, studies of, like, contemporary poetry, uh, and, and specifically, I guess, like, responding to this, like, like the framework surrounding, like, conceptualism. Um, and, you know, I think... 
you know, those, like, those, like, na navigating those pathways, I think, you know, is always, is always a bit difficult, uh, especially if you set out specifically to navigate those pathways. So the, the, the approach that I've always taken is to instead uh, start with, like, uh, like a, like a problem-based or a project-based approach, uh, and then to, you know, have, have the frameworks on the periphery. Uh, so, like, specifically, uh, when I was writing my first book, uh, it's a book called The Place of Scraps. Uh, that book, um, it, it's all about uh, salvage anthropology. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and I think, in part, that book is a critique of it, how anthropology developed as a discipline, essentially. Um, but when I was writing it, I wasn't like I, I didn't have that framework in mind. The thing that I was that I was trying to write towards was my personal kind of relationship with the, um, I guess, uh, leg legacy of uh, the 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 the, le the legacy uh, of kind of uh, colonial violence that the, the discipline of anthropology kind of started, or like, and specifically that Marius Barbeau as an anthropologist kind of started. Um, and so like, I, I concentrated very specifically on that like, particular problem or issue, and I, and I kept trying to write towards that, and try, kept trying to figure out ways to, to figure out, you know, how to write about that, and I think, you know, as as a result, you know, I ended up writing, writing this thing that, you know, I think, um, you know, is partly partly erasure poetry, partly critique of uh, anthropology from a, a kind of indigenous studies approach, but also kind of not. Um, so it, it was so, you know, I think there's like. I mean, there, there's there's so there's so many layers. I think there when when you're navigating, when you're navigating like, through those pathways, that you know it is kind of tough to keep them all together. But yeah, I mean, my my thinking is to to zero in on the project and then you know fit the frameworks around the project <laughs> afterwards. Yeah. So um, they did not co-evolve. <laughs> I so I'm I'm usually like a I guess for lack of better phrases a page first kind of writer. So uh, you know I start I start with the the project and you know it it's all built around um, it, it, it's all built around how it works on the page. Uh, and it just so happens that because of the ways that I build things around the page, like sometimes there are moments that are very difficult to perform. Uh, specifically, like just thinking about this section from Uninhabited up here, uh, that's you know very uh, concrete and visual. You know, I think there's there's moments like that throughout all of my writing. Uh, and I, I know some conceptual writers and some visual concrete writers who kind of shy away from attempting to engage performatively with those particular moments in their writing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think you know, part of that is because of a, a level of difficulty that those particular kinds of pieces demand from a, a performance. Uh, but for me, I, I think I'm really interested in those moments. I'm really interested in, like, in moment in like in pieces of writing that are difficult to perform, uh, and seeing you know and and thinking through how I might perform those pieces, uh, so I, I kind of set myself up on this really difficult path where I would write this super uh, I'd write this like super difficult poetry on the page and then have to figure out some way to perform it, uh, you know, which has like, been really challenging each time I've done it. Um, and I really hope one day I write a, a book where I can just read it in front of a microphone. <laughs> that would be great. Uh, <laughs> but I haven't done that yet. So I think you know, the, the way I, I went about building this performance was by thinking about 
the conceptual methods that I used to bring this project to the page in the first place. And the first thing that kind of came to mind was the cut up. So when I found those 500 sentences that had the word engine in them and, you know, used like scissors to cut them up and rearrange each section, I, I, was, I was thinking like, oh, that might be, like there's an equivalent kind of, uh, audio method of, of sampling that might, you know, replicate that process or, you know, might, uh, like, yeah, articulate, be, like, or be used to articulate that kind of conceptual methodology. So that's kind of like the starting point that I, I came to when I was attempting to put the audio piece together. Um, but the, I mean, the, the software that I use is DJ software. Uh, which you know, I think there's also there's also a connection there because you know, uh, D DJs are really into sampling, you know, and I think the the way that my poetics works, you know, also also has a relationship to sampling and appropriation or redistribution and reorganization. Um, so I think there's there's a bunch of intersecting points there where my work on the page and my work in performance, I think, um, kind of come together, but also diverge in certain places. Like the, uh, like the, like if you were to um, just hear the performance without seeing the, the poem, you might think there are two totally separate entities. And I, and I think to a certain extent, I mean, that is true, the performance like, to me, the performance necessarily takes on its own identity, I think. Is the performance different, a little bit different every time? It is, yeah. Uh, so um, the, way, the way I like to describe it is that there are certain moments I, like, I try and get to, but, uh, but it's ultimately uh, partly improvisational. Cool. Um, so there's certain pieces that, you know, um, that... Are, are audible in some performances and certain pieces that are inaudible in other performances. So each, so what I hear is that if you hear it multiple times, it, you don't necessarily hear the same things. <laughs> that was a different era of scholarship. Indians feel this way. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think, was, yeah. You know, one of the things that, uh, that I think is really interesting about, uh, about, about that era of scholarship is that there's this, like, like indigeneity or aboriginality like, as this kind of, like, monolith. You know, there's like this one way of being uh, indigenous or be, in, in this case, there's one way of being Indian. <laughs> and, you know, I think uh, one of the things that my, my work really, I think, responds to um, is this idea of, uh, of, of positionality within indigeneity. Uh, so, I mean, there's, uh, so, um, I'm, I'm just thinking about, uh, I'm, you, you might not know these authors, but there's, there's a bunch of uh, indigenous um, authors who are writing in Canada who are, who, who, who's writing, I think, really, really kind of uh, zeroes in on indigenous nationalism. So for example, uh, Leanne Simpson, who's a really amazing writer, really write, like, like her writing is about Anishinaabe uh, thinking and language and understandings. Um, and Neil McLeod's writing, you know, is very, very much focused on Cree worldviews and understandings. So there's like, they're, so they're very focused on, you know, how, like, how their indigenous nationality, like, 
forms a lens for how they see the world. Uh, and I think one of the things that my, my writing, I, I think, responds to is I, I, an additional uh, kind of subset of indigeneity, I think, that's kind of like a, a little bit of like a Venn diagram in between uh, being both a sur intergenerational survivor of residential schools and also an urban indigenous person. Um, and attempting to, and then attempting to articulate what uh, what that position within indigeneity means, or you know how that position uh, is is where it is in relation to other positions within indigeneity. Um, so you know, I think there's like there's a lot of there, there's, 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 and, and I, I think you know, just from an indige indigenous studies perspective, you know, there are numerous positions within indigeneity that you know are worth thinking about and thinking through, and, uh, <laughs> and you know, I, I, I think you know that that's like in a whole enormous discussion, I guess, uh, but you know, I think. I don't know, that abstract, that abstract is really funny. <laughs> Indians feel this way about Westerns. <laughs> I think, you know, my, uh, I, yeah, I, I'd, have, I'd have to probably like re read the paper, uh, but I, I feel distrustful immediately. <laughs>
there, yeah, there's, there's this whole like, uh, you know, iceberg underneath there that, you know, I think needs to be talked about to even really begin, um, to a address how and why that label is problematic. Uh, but you know, it, I think it starts with like all of the other connotations and stuff that terrorism brings along with it. And whether or not any of those things, like whether or not, yeah, like whether or not like certain kinds of poetry maybe do fall under that that banner you know i think i, I think they also those kinds of poetry fall under other banners that are have better labels although still the problem of labels <laughs> um yeah yeah absolutely <laughs> And it's, uh, yeah, for me, it's not one that I, I, I want to wear on my sleeve. <laughs> I get that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Okay, well, thank, thank you guys so much. It was a pleasure.